Welcome back fellow explorers to Project Markiraji. In today's episode, we will explore the Arctic ecosystems of Markiraji. The poles of Markiraji are some of the harshest environments on the planet. With daytime temperatures rarely, if ever, exceeding 0 degrees Celsius and nighttime temperatures as cold as negative 80 degrees, life grinds to an almost total standstill. Interestingly the North and South Pole are almost completely isolated from each other, meaning that most species in the North and South Pole will be completely separate and unique from each other. Markiraj's North Pole is a desolate wasteland where only the toughest organisms can survive. Because of Markiraj's ocean currents, this region offers fewer nutrients available to surface-dwelling creatures. However, the South Pole is quite the opposite. Ocean currents upwell and flush the surface waters of the southern oceans with nutrients providing sustenance for countless organisms. We will begin our journey here in the South Pole. As nutrients flood into the southern ocean, they sustain massive plankton blooms, which in turn feed massive swarms of a new clade of Cadolla. These swarms may grow exponentially larger, increasing in size tenfold, as the Cadolla themselves may grow smaller in size due to evolutionary specialization to feed on plankton. When not during the breeding season these swarms may be around 50,000 strong. However, when the breeding season comes many swarms may congregate forming super swarms comprised of up to 500,000 individuals. Once the breeding season is over the females will lay their eggs and die, as will the males. The eggs will lay dormant until conditions are optimal for them to hatch. We will call these remarkable creatures the Teuthymus. They grow up to 2 inches long and live for up to a year. These swarms would be a sight to behold, and inevitably they would attract predators. A population of Nugapala that find themselves in the southern oceans may specialize to feed on these swarms, as there aren't many viata in these colder oceans. They may swiftly swim through the swarm with their mouths open, trying to catch as many Teuthymus as possible. As they develop for this hunting style, they may adapt to optimize their catch. To do this they may evolve a thin membrane between their tentacles. When swimming they will open their tentacles and funnel Teuthymus into their mouths. When feeding on a super swarm, the Nugapala will hunt alone feeding on a sea teeming with an abundance of Teuthymus. However, when the Teuthymus are not in super swarms the Nugapala will hunt in packs of up to 10 individuals. These packs are comprised of one or two males with the rest being female. The pack will coral a smaller swarm of Teuthymus, circling them into a tight cluster, while one member dashes through the swarm capturing as many Teuthymus as possible. It is when traveling in these hunting packs that the Nugapala breed. A mother's eggs will develop inside her body for around one Earth month. When the eggs are developed and ready for fertilization, she then deposits them on the ocean floor. The males of the pack will then dive in to fertilize the eggs. While the mother is bearing eggs, it is the job of the other pack members to protect her. If a rival male infiltrates the pack and discovers an egg-bearing mother, he will most likely destroy the eggs when late. We will call these unique hunters the Constapala. They grow up to 4 feet long and live up to 15 years. The southern plankton blooms sustain life in the ocean, from some of the smallest creatures to the largest. The sheer amount of plankton during the blooms will allow the Arctic primanti to grow into the largest creatures on Markiraji. In order to keep warm, they may develop a thick layer of blubber for insulation from the cold waters. Their bottom two tentacles have grown extremely large and muscular and are covered in filter-feeding bristles adapted to collect massive amounts of plankton and bring it towards their mouth. While they mainly feed on plankton, 
they won't pass up a swarm of Tuthymus. Most species in this clade are highly antisocial. Although these animals produce eggs, they don't lay them. Instead, the young hatch while still in the female's body, being born as miniature adults. This is known as ovoviviparity. They will give birth to only one to two young at a time. Females will travel with their child for around an earth year before they separate. They do this to protect the young from predators such as the Verarella, during what is a relatively long developmental stage. Although they are primarily found in the South Pole, they do sometimes migrate north, to more temperate waters. We will call these giants the Teleranti, they may grow up to 25 feet long, and live for up to 40 years. Of course the abundance of nutrients will allow plants to grow here. Relatives of the Atophogile may adapt to grow on the underside of the sea ice. In order to combat the strong southern currents, they may convergently develop a holdfast-like structure similar to that of the Dufogile. However, they may still retain their ancestral gas sac, although it may be internalized. This is to ensure they will stay near the surface of the ice even if they get detached. While still capable of photosynthesis, they have also developed predatory tendencies with the ability to feed on the plankton blooms. They do this by expanding a pouch-like structure to draw in seawater and filter the nutrient-rich brine, then they contract the pouch to expel the filtered water. These plants produce gametes in pouches connected to their feeding pouch. If conditions are favorable, they will release their gametes into the water. However, if conditions are not favorable, they may alternate to asexual reproduction. They may achieve this by sending a runner out from the mother plant, on which multiple daughter plants will sprout. We will call these unique atophogile, the glacophogile. They mainly inhabit southern waters, but some species may also be found in the north. The glacophogile now represent an untapped food source which a population of Viata may quickly take advantage of. However, feeding on the glacophogile would be quite the challenge, since they grow on the underside of the ice. To access them their bottom may develop a suction cup-like structure. This would allow them to crawl on the underside of the ice. Since they would be constantly making direct contact with the ice, they may develop extra thick fatty layer around this region. Their pedipalps may grow more muscular in order to pluck the glacophogile from the ice. Their four eyes may migrate to the top of their head, giving them a better view of the water below them. When threatened by a predator, they will flush a patch on their head with blood, producing a bright red display. They may back up this threatening display with a mild toxin, which would make any unfortunate predators sick to their stomachs. These creatures grow up to one foot long, and live for up to five years. We will call them the Pendices. With threats like the Constipala roaming the oceans, some Cadola may find a new way to avoid them. In the Arctic, the extremely cold waters allow creatures' metabolisms to slow. This means they may not be as active, as most chemical processes in the body happen slower at colder temperatures. This means they require less energy to function in colder waters. However, a clay descending from the Cadola may evolve specialized proteins in their blood that act like antifreeze. This allows these creatures to be more active, which helps when escaping predators or chasing prey. We will call these creatures the adipinguis. They grow up to 6 inches long, and live for up to 8 years. Now we finally cross the oceans and find ourselves at the north pole of Markiraji. The movement of surface currents in this region plays a key role in the vertical movements of deeper water. 
Makiraj's northern ocean is an area where several surface currents converge causing a process called downwelling, where surface water is forced downwards. The converging water has nowhere to go but down, so the surface water sinks. The process of downwelling contributes to the North Pole's comparative low productivity. The resulting lack of any large plankton blooms forces inhabitants to find other forms of nourishment. Meet the Fodinosus, relatives of the Abitantibuca. These creatures have developed an innovative feeding method. They slither on the bottom of the sea floor with their mouths wide open, feeding upon the microorganisms living in the mud. They do this by utilizing a ring of specialized teeth located in their throat that filters the mud. When threatened by a predator, they may kick up sand and swim away. They are also capable of burying themselves in the sand, perfectly concealing themselves. They have multiple spawning seasons throughout the year. During mating season males will track down females and cling onto them fiercely. If another male finds the pair mating, he will try to dislodge the male and take the female for himself. The males swarm, resulting in a mating ball with 20 or more males attempting to mate with a single female. These creatures grow up to one foot long and live for up to 10 years. A population of northern Bacolta have grown exponentially larger and reached relatively enormous sizes when compared to their ancestors. This adaptation is in an effort to combat the extreme cold as it resulted in an increased surface area to volume ratio. Larger animals have a smaller surface area to volume ratio, this means they lose heat slower to the colder environment. Their size also protects them from predators, but only as adults. The young would still be vulnerable to predation. To combat this, these creatures travel in maternal herds working as a community where the adults share the responsibility of protecting the young. These creatures do not have a specific breeding season. Once a male has fertilized a female's eggs, the female will attach the fertilized eggs to their back with their tentacles. A typical clutch would consist of three to five eggs. We will call these massive bacolta, the cribicalta. They may grow up to five feet long and live for up to 18 years. Due to the sparseness of resources available in the North Pole, many animals will opt to travel extremely long distances in search of food. Some northern dwelling Kadola may adopt this nomadic lifestyle. They have developed an extremely large heart for their size. This is accompanied by a complex circulatory system, which is designed to deliver oxygen to the muscles with maximum efficiency. They may be larger than their relatives, with a more streamlined body shape. These Kadola travel in schools of up to 50 individuals and are extremely fast swimmers. They use their speed and numbers to evade predators such as Verarella and other threats. During spawning season multiple schools of Kadola may migrate to warmer waters, where they will lay their eggs. Once their young hatch, they will stay in warmer waters until fully mature. We will call these large Kadola, the Gigdola. They grow up to 4 feet long and live for up to 20 years. In every ecosystem, there is bound to be an apex predator, and it is no different for the Arctic regions of Makiraji. The Arctic Verarella may evolve to fill this role in both the northern and southern oceans. However, hunting creatures like the Kadola and Gigdola present some key challenges. Schooling creatures tend to move in tight groups. This tactic can effectively confuse predators relying solely on sight or brute force. Instead, the Arctic Verarella may develop a whip-like tail fin. The rapid strike of this appendage could create a pressure wave that disrupts the tight formations of schooling prey. 
This disorientation would make individual fish easier targets. Younger Verarella may compete with adults if they're going for the same school of fish. This could lead to injury or even death for the juvenile. To avoid this fate, they may undergo dietary partitioning, in which the adults and juveniles feed on different food sources to avoid interspecies competition. The whip could offer young Verarella a unique way to find hidden prey. The whipping motion could stir up sediment on the seafloor, potentially flushing out creatures like the Fodenosis or Sabascosta from their hiding places, making them easier targets for the Verarella. Once they have stunned their prey, they go in for the kill, puncturing their prey with the bony tips of their three tentacles. Depending on the size of the prey, these arctic verarella may swallow it whole, or, for larger catches, they will use the tentacles to rip their meal into smaller bites. The arctic verarella have also evolved two specialized fins that aid them in their predatory lifestyle. Atop their back runs a dorsal fin, which acts like a rudder, helping them steer and maneuver with precision. This is crucial when chasing elusive prey such as the Gigdola. On their underside, they possess a fin similar in function to pelvic fins. This fin acts like a base, keeping them balanced and stable as they hunt. This stability is especially important when they need to make sudden stops or changes in direction to pursue their prey. We will call these arctic hunters the Ferularella. They grow up to 8 feet long and live for up to 25 years. The Pectochrista may have some representatives in the arctic, as they would have followed the larger animals that they clean but soon they may start to diverge. The colder temperatures and unique prey of the Arctic could lead to interesting adaptations. The Pectochrista may become more specialized in scavenging, feeding on the scraps of their hosts. They might evolve stronger gripping tentacles, allowing them to more effectively hitch rides on larger and faster creatures. This would also help them find mates, as they could travel longer distances on a host. They may choose specific hosts that would offer protection. Creatures such as the Teleranti would unintentionally protect the Pectochrista as few predators would risk attacking a behemoth like the Teleranti. We will call this clay the Siatandi. They grow up to 5 inches long and live for up to 3 years. Indeed, the polar ecosystems of Makiraji have proven to be a harsh environment, yet life prevails. The toughest and most resourceful creatures have not only survived, but thrived, by relying on keen adaptations and exotic modifications tailored to suit the opposing polar conditions and exploit what limited resources are available. In the next episode, we will discuss an equally inhospitable ecosystem fraught with its own unique challenges and exceptional inhabitants. In the next episode, we will explore the deep sea. A huge thank you to all the artists on Discord who made fan art for this episode. Your contributions to this project were invaluable. If you want to join the Discord server, you can find the link in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share your thoughts on these incredible creatures. See you in the next episode.